Okay, guys, I am super pumped for today's conversation around imposter syndrome. This is something that plagues more than 70% of people, believe it or not. And more often than not, interestingly enough, imposter syndrome often plagues high achievers. Dun, dun, dun. Cliffhanger there, because more often than not, we would think that if you're a high achiever, you have lots of evidence of how successful that you are, and therefore you wouldn't feel like an imposter. But all evidence actually proves that that's wrong, and that imposter syndrome, more often than not, really impacts high achievers because we are always expecting some higher level of ourselves. And we're often in a position where we're not exactly seeing the results of what we've done, even if there's plenty of evidence, instead we get inside of our head. Imposter, it's interesting because imposter syndrome really affects all kinds of people from all parts of life, men, women, uh, you could be a doctor, you could be an ad executive, you could be an actor, you could be a, a coach, you could be a bus driver, like you could literally be anything and you can still navigate what psychologists call the imposter phenomenon. And I think that it's really interesting because it can trip us up to the point where we are the ones who end up holding ourselves back. So one of the things that has been talked about when it comes to imposter syndrome is that imposter syndrome is largely characterized by not being able to internalize your own successes. So if you're thinking to yourself, like, do I have imposter syndrome? It has a lot to do with like the doubt that we feel within ourselves. And a lot of times it's us being unable to feel our own successes and really internalize those as to the type of person that we are. Um, so why do people experience imposter syndrome. Now, there's no single answer to this. And I think that's important for us to understand. Some people think that it has to do with personality traits like anxiety or being neurotic. While a lot of other researchers and scientists and therapists, what they look at is focus on the family of origin or behavioral causes. So whether it goes all the way back to what your parents expected of you, and therefore it was never good enough. So therefore now you as an adult are perpetuating this cycle of it's not good enough, or you have equated your achievement to your sense of worth or how lovable or loved that you are, then we'll get on this cycle of I like I need to achieve or I don't have worth. And when we get onto this cycle, we can often get stuck in this trap of imposter syndrome, feeling like nothing is ever good enough. There's also factors outside of a person, whether it's our environment, um, like the culture in which we live in, our fears around imposter syndrome have everything to do with wanting to feel confident, wanting to feel like we belong, wanting to feel like we are part of something. So it's interesting because when we want to belong to a group, if we feel like we're outside of that group for any reason, like let's say you work in the science field, but you're a woman, not but, and you're a woman, um, and most of your counterparts are male or even in the corporate sphere where you're like, okay, everyone who holds my same position is male. We want to belong, but just by sheer virtue of being a female, you might feel like you don't belong. And therefore you're trying to almost outdo the dudes or outperform because you don't feel like you deserve to have that seat at the table, whether it's because of your resume or sometimes it's often because everyone around you maybe doesn't look like you. This can have to do with gender. This can have to do with age. This can have to do with race. This can even have to do with what your perception is of other people's credentials. If you're looking around, you're like, oh God, all these people are Ivy League, but oh, that's not the school I went to. I might not belong here, right? And when we don't feel like we belong, our confidence shrieks, shrinks. Sorry, guys. Uh, so I'm gonna take a sip of my water. So it's important that when we identify that we're navigating imposter syndrome, we figure out how we want to deal with it, right? So step one is often just allowing ourselves to be an observer. When we are an observer of ourselves, we can start to identify like, what are the triggering settings in which I feel like an imposter? What is my narrative, right? What are the thoughts that I have? So we could critically examine the thoughts that we have, because if we're seeing that our thoughts 
are making us feel right. This is a self-talk cycle guys. I talk about all of this in my book on your power. So if we think about our thoughts, control our feelings, control our actions, right? Thoughts, feelings, actions. Well, if my thoughts are, I don't belong here. Uh, I'm not good enough. Everyone else is go- is better than I am, or they're going to find out that I'm like a complete fraud and I have no idea who I am or what I'm doing here. And I hope I don't screw it all up. Then how do we feel? We feel insecure, right? We have doubt. Maybe we're, and then what are our actions? Maybe we're overworking. Maybe we're trying to constantly prove ourselves. Maybe we're shrinking back from raising our hand or putting ourselves out there or volunteering or pushing ahead because we don't feel like we are really internalizing our successes and we don't feel like we deserve a voice or a seat at the table. So it's about reframing our thoughts. The first thing we have to do is sit back. We have to observe what those thoughts are, observe how we are engaging with others, observe how we are taking action or not holding ourselves back. Second thing that we need to do is then an effort in reframing those thoughts. Again, this comes right out of my book, Own Your Power. You can grab it on Amazon. But in Own Your Power, we talk about this concept called observing and catching. It's one of the things that we do in our signature program, Own Your Power. And that is that process of observing what the thoughts are, but instead of judging them, teaching the the exact tools that you need so that you can then catch those feelings instead of constantly reacting to those feelings. Interestingly enough, as we are observing ourselves and we are healing ourselves from this trap of imposter syndrome, the thing that I think is most interesting is that there's not just one kind of imposter syndrome. What researchers are showing is that there are five kinds. And to me, I'm like, well, maybe there's variations or a spectrum, but essentially what researchers are showing is that there's five kinds of imposter syndrome. Interesting. So just listen in, I'm going to describe these to you and see like which ones resonate for me, which ones feel like, oh no, I check some of those boxes. So one, perfectionists, right? And perfectionists have a tendency to set extremely high goals and expectations for themselves. Even if they meet 99% of those goals, they're going to be focused on those failures. They're going to be focused on any small mistake is going to make perfectionists question their incompetence. The second a type of imposter syndrome is experts, right? People who feel like they need to know every single piece of the information before they can start a project. And they're constantly looking for new, new certifications or trainings to improve their skills. Sometimes these experts, right? That's just, it's a label and I'm not about pathologizing. It's just understanding that there's a spectrum and that you might not check every box of feeling like an imposter, but when we start to talk about these five types, maybe some of it resonates with you. But an expert type, often these people won't even apply for jobs if they don't feel like they meet all of the criteria in the posting. This is interesting. Sheryl Sandberg talks about this in her book, Lean In. And one of the things that she talks about is research is showing that more often men, and again, I don't want to put it on gender lines, but men will apply if they're at least 60% qualified, whereas women won't apply unless they're between 80 and 85% qualified. It's very interesting. Who thinks that they're an imposter? And experts will often even hesitate to ask a question in a meeting or speak up because they're afraid of looking stupid or that they don't already know the answer. Uh, Third type, Third type is the natural genius. So when a natural genius has to struggle or work hard to accomplish something, they think that this means that they're not good enough, right? They're used to skills coming easily for them. So when they have to put in the effort, their brain tells them that's proof that I'm an imposter. That's proof I don't know what I'm doing. Um, I definitely navigated that for myself. Um, School always came very easily for me. Always. And, but when I would come up against something that was challenging for me, a lot of times I would immediately back down because I was like, well, everything else comes easily. So clearly like, I must not know this. I'm not going to push hard or work through it. And then I was reading a book by Poe Bronson and Ashley Merriweather called Nurture Shock. Great book. And one of the things that they talked about is the way in which we praise children right? If we praise kids and I, I, not that we're children, but this is important because this goes back to our family of origin and what we learned, which is the playbook of what's going on in our head. But if we're praised for being smart, 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 we shouldn't praise children for being smart. Instead, what research was showing was that when we praised kids for working hard, they actually worked through when they came up against a wall. So for me, 
that would have been something that would really have helped me growing up because I was always told that I was very, very smart. And, and yes, things came easily to me when it was academics, but then when I would hit a wall, I would back down because I was just not used to not already knowing the answer. Um, so that's something I've navigated. I'm probably type three guys, uh, type four soloists. So this is interesting. Soloists feel like they have to accomplish tasks on their own. And if they need to ask for help, they think that means that they're a failure or a fraud, right? One of the ways I'd love to describe this to my clients is there's an easier way to carry a couch. We have two options. One, if we have to get the couch into the house onto the second floor, you can either throw that whole big bad boy right on your back and try and get yourself up the stairs, or it's going to be a lot easier to ask somebody to grab one end of the couch. And that analogy seems to like put off light bulbs in all my clients' heads because then they think like, actually, you're right. They were struggling with that soloist feeling like they had to do everything themselves, or that would mean that they're a failure or a fraud. Whereas when I made a simple example, like, hey guys, it's easier to ask for help you still get the, the job done. And it doesn't mean that you're any more or less of a person to have somebody else carry the other end of the couch. It makes it a lot easier, right? Working together. And then finally, and I'm sure I've been here too, uh, type number five of imposter syndrome, supermen or superwomen is what they identify them as. And someone who pushes themselves to work harder than those around them to prove that they're not imposters. They feel the need to succeed in all aspects of their life. They want to succeed at work, as parents, as partners, and they may feel stress when they're not actively working on accomplishing something. And it's interesting right? Do you find that you're always spinning your wheels? Do you find that you're always pushing and that it never feels good enough? You can't actually internalize your successes. Again, these might be hallmarks of being a high achiever, but if you can't actually feel the success or the check mark or like the achievement of the goal, then it's time to kind of recalibrate your system. And again, that is why we do the work that we do at MindRise. That is 100% why we became a coaching company. It's because I've been there, guys. I've been there in that place of just running that race so hard and not actually stopping to look around and check in on what's the narrative that's driving me to do the things that I'm doing? Do I actually feel successful in what I'm doing? Or do I feel like, again, I'm always on that treadmill? So if you're feeling like you're ready for a change, I would highly, highly encourage you to pop on over, go to mindrise.com or just shoot me an email. We're really accessible, bailey at themindrise.com. Shoot us a DM on Instagram or on LinkedIn, uh, Facebook. We're here to help because that's the thing. When you want to do big things in the world, you just need to learn how to get out of your own way. And that's exactly what we're going to teach you to do. So if you struggle with imposter syndrome, give me a shout because we can absolutely help you with that. I hope you guys all have a great rest of your day um, and that you've enjoyed this video. Bye.